nor angels, nor principalities, nor powers, nor things present, nor things to come, nor height, nor depth, nor any other created thing shall be able to separate us from the love of God, which is in Christ Jesus, our Lord. I don't think that we have begun to understand how much God loves us. Um, John says that we love him because he first loved us and sent his son to be our substitutionary sacrifice. And I think as we grow in our understanding of the benefits that God has given us in Christ, and as we look at the world around us and see all the good things that God has done for us, we will understand his love for us better. And it will activate in us more capacity to love. And what follows love is obedience, right? So it will activate in us a greater capacity to love and obey him. Let's sing together, I am his and he is mine. Please stand with me as we sing. Loved with everlasting love, led by grace that love to know, gracious spirit from above, thou hast taught me it is so, all this full and perfect peace, all this transport all divine, in a love which cannot cease, I am his and he is mine. In a love which cannot cease, I am his and he is mine. Have no love is softer blue, earth around is sweeter green. Something lives in every hue, Christless eyes have never seen. Birds with gladder songs o'erflow, flowers with deeper beauty shine. No, as now I know, I am his and he is mine. Since I know, as now I know, I am his and he is mine. His forever only his, who the Lord and me shall part ah with what a rest of bliss christ can fill the loving heart heaven and earth may fade and flee firstborn light in gloom decline but while god and i shall be I am his and he is mine, but while God and I shall be, I am his and he is mine. Amen. You may be seated. Ecclesiastes chapter 9. Ecclesiastes chapter 9. We're going to be looking at verses 10 through 18 this morning. Ecclesiastes 9, 10 through 18. We finished with 10 last week, but it provides for us an excellent connection to um, what we're going to be talking about this morning. So we're covering that again just a little bit by way of introduction. The title of the message is The Next Contenders, Time and Chance versus Wisdom, because this is the comparison that Solomon is making in the text this morning. Well, I want to say by way of thanks, for the last six months, this clock here has been an hour off, but it's on this morning, so whoever fixed that for me, thank you. I really appreciate it. It's been throwing me off every Sunday for the last six months, so really helps. I'm very appreciative. 
Our nation likes comparisons. We compare sports teams. There's rivalries, whether they're local rivalries within, sorry, within counties or, or broad rivalries between states and professional sports teams across the nation. People compare their favorite actors, their favorite singers, and yes, we even compare the yellow team with the red team, the green team, and the blue team. <clears throat> and kids for truth. Over these last few months, we've seen a pretty heavily advertised comparison being made between two individuals and really two political parties. And I think many of us are exhausted with the whole process. If you have been aware of the process and you aren't exhausted with it, maybe you should talk to me afterwards. This has not been a lovely election season for us. And a lot of times we think about these comparisons and we say, well, you know, not all comparisons are useful. Um, let me warn you all from the outset that comparing yourself with someone else is probably not going to do you or them much good. Because normally when we compare ourselves with someone else, it's to do ourselves a favor. And um, I normally say, especially when my kids are, are headed in this direction and they can't defend themselves this morning, they're home with sniffles and sore throats and runny noses. No fevers, folks, no fear. Um, that most comparisons are useless and that I would com encourage them to compare themselves with Christ, not to see a unremitted record of failure, but to see how it is that God can grow the character of Christ in them. Because that actually is a beautiful thing to see and to experience if it is something that we are actively pursuing. And by the way, that doesn't happen by chance. It is something that we must, as Christians, actively pursue. And if we are not actively pursuing it, then um, I think that we are probably not growing in Christ. But some comparisons are useful. They allow us to see two or more different choices in contrast with one another. One of, the, one of the great skills of wisdom or synonyms of the word wisdom often used throughout the Bible is discernment. And being able to compare things and discern which is better than the other or to look at a thing and discern whether or not it is good or evil is a sign of Christian maturity. And if we as Christians are making choices based not upon upon whether or not we are actively discerning what a thing is, whether it's good or evil, but rather we're just saying, ah, I don't know, I'm just going to try it. Then we are not exercising biblical wisdom. We are not exercising discernment. Now, in the book of Ecclesiastes, in his essay here, Solomon has been making a lot of comparisons. He's compared wisdom and folly. And in this comparison, he says wisdom is to be preferred above folly. But in the end, they're both vanity. He has been comparing work and wisdom. He actually set those, sets those two off against each other in the first three chapters in his introduction. He compares work and folly. He compares the fear of the Lord and merely living under the sun. In this passage, we're going to look at Solomon comparing time and chance as a single unit, more or less, with wisdom. He's going to look at these two things next door to each other and hopefully give us some perspective in how to live within the fear of the Lord in a place where we're stuck under the sun because here we are. It's up there and we can't get away from it. We live in a fallen world and yet we have been told to live by means of the fear of the Lord. Let's read the passage here starting in verse 10. Whatever your hand finds to do, do it with your might. For there is no work or device or knowledge or wisdom in the world, excuse me, in the grave where you are going. I returned and saw unto the sun that the race is not to the swift, nor the battle to the strong, nor bread to the wise, nor riches to men of understanding, nor favor to men of skill, but time and chance happen to them all. For man does not also know his time, like fish taken in a cruel net, like birds caught in a snare, so are the sons of men snared in an evil time when it falls upon them suddenly. This wisdom I have also seen under the sun, and it seemed great to me that there was a little city with few men in it, and a great king came against it, besieged it, and built great snares around it. Now there was found in that city a poor wise man, and he by his wisdom delivered the city. Yet no one remembered the same poor man. Then I said, Wisdom is better than strength. 
Nevertheless, the poor man's wisdom is despised, and his words are not heard. Words of the wise spoken quietly should be heard rather than the shout of a ruler of fools. Wisdom is better than weapons of war, but one sinner destroys much good. Let's pray and ask the Lord to encourage us through this passage this morning. Thank you, Father, for your lively and powerful word. And thank you for your love for us, which we have, I hope we have enjoyed reflecting on this morning and worshiping you in. I pray that you'd help us to be open-hearted to the sanctifying influence of your word, that your Holy Spirit would take this book of his and use, us, use it to help us see the image of Christ and to make that most useful of all comparisons and that through that mirror that we may look at ourselves in, we could be conformed to his image so that you are glorified and so that we are full of joy and peace so that our lives are fulfilled in your will. In Jesus' name I pray, amen. Big idea this morning. Man's wisdom, no matter how great, is at the mercy of time and chance. Therefore, we must live by God's wisdom in the fear of the Lord. Let me restate that. It's a longer one. Usually I try to keep them shorter, but I couldn't this time. Man's wisdom, no matter how great, is at the mercy of time and chance. Therefore, we must live by God's wisdom in the fear of the Lord. And we'll see this in the trials of time and the weakness of wisdom. First of all, the trials of time. I just want to reread verse 10 and comment on it briefly because it sets the stage for the rest of this passage. 10 says, Whatever your hand finds to do, do it with all your might. For there is no work or device or knowledge or wisdom in the grave where you are going. And so Solomon is saying, Hey, while you're working here on the earth, have a good purposes and do them exuberantly. Have plans and pursue them. Make strong and beautiful things. Your job, enjoy it. And if you don't enjoy it, maybe you should look for a new job that you can enjoy and do good work in your enjoyment. Be fulfilled in the work that you have. Enjoy your hobbies. Create beautiful things. Because this is the task that God has given you. When you find something worth doing it, do it wholeheartedly. Do it with exuberance. But then in verse 11, he lets us down. He lets us down a lot. And he says, life's not fair. So remember, in the context, he says, if you're good at something, do it and do it well. But beware your expectations because life's not fair. After all, if the thing that you're good at is running, well, the race is not to the swift. And if the thing that you're good at is fighting, well, the battle is not to the strong. And if the thing that you're good at is making wise decisions, well, bread is not to the wise. And if you are capable of making the right sorts of financial investments, and if you understand how the economic system around you works, well, I'm sorry to say this, but wealth is not to the understanding. And if you think that you have ability in a particular area, so much ability, in fact, that the leader of your little realm, the mayor of your city, the governor of your state, the president of your nation, should use you as the person in that position because you are supremely talented. You are good at making the right decisions and the right recommendations, and you have the skill to profit not just yourself, but the whole of your area of influence, I'm sorry to say it, but favor, the king's favor does not go to the man of skill. Instead, time and chance happen to them all. You see, life's not fair. Injury, injustice, and illness can make the race not go to the swift. And so in matters of friendly competition, the outcome is not fair all the time. But guess what? Often it is, right? Solomon is not claiming that things always go wrong. In fact, he elsewhere claims that things normally go right. What he's saying here is, you can't expect it to always go right. Often enough, when you expect one outcome, the other is coming. And you don't know it, but it's going to fall on you like a load of bricks because life is not fair. The race is not to the swift. The battle is not to, not to the strong. 
The race is not to the swift is about just casual, friendly competition. In matters of deadly import, however, the strongest contender does not always win. Sometimes this can be a very bad thing. And as we'll see later in his example here, in his illustration, sometimes it's a good thing. There was a weak city with one wise poor man, and they survived. The battle is not always to the strong. Bread does not always go to the wise in matters of living well in the world. Knowing how to make a success of it with wise decisions, the wise don't always get the best results. But they often do. So beware your expectations. Wealth does not always go to the understanding in matters of wise investing, putting your money into careful places, making good decisions about which crops to plant where, who to trust and who to avoid. These people who are experts in these sorts of decisions, they don't always make the most money. They don't always have the greatest success. They often do, but it doesn't always produce the result that we'd expect it would. And favor does not go to the man of skill. Who does the boss promote into that important position? Who does the king appoint? It's not always the person who is most qualified. Oftentimes, it's just the friend or the person who strokes the, the, the leader's ego the most, or the one who is related to him, the family member who's going to get into that, that important position. And we all have seen this in a large sense in national politics. We've also, I'm sure, experienced this individually. It doesn't always happen this way, but it does often enough. And so we need to beware our expectation because time and chance happen to all. Life isn't fair. Often it is, but sometimes it isn't. So beware your expectations because God has given us gifts and talents, things that we are good at. Maybe we can run fast. Maybe we are strong. Maybe we are wise. Maybe we are especially skilled in one area or another. And Solomon encourages us in verse 10, if you have any of that, do it exuberantly. Do it with all of your might, but beware your expectations, according to verse 11. For verse 12, the pessimists are right. A man does not always know his time. Like fish taken in a cruel net, like birds caught in a snare, so are the sons of men snared in an evil time when it falls suddenly upon him. Now, we've got a lot of fishermen in this church. And boy, you guys are mean to fish. I fished a little bit too. I'm not a very good fisherman. It seems like whenever I go fishing with these guys, they catch less. But think about it for a moment. Would you like it if you were really hungry and you needed something to eat and so you went out to find something to eat and in getting that thing to eat because it's just natural, you needed something to eat, you were hooked, removed from your environment, bashed on the head, flayed, broiled, chewed, swallowed, and digested. Does that sound fair? Does that sound nice? Did you hear a uh, fish caught in a cruel net? Now, our guys don't use nets often. Maybe that's the last step when you get it close to the boat. But man, Solomon's picture here is a potent one. When, when the fair thing doesn't happen, boy, does it feel unjust. Boy, does it feel cruel even to have worked hard, to have done well, to have pursued with exuberance the thing that you're good at, the race, the strength, the wisdom, the knowledge, and to have your feet swept out from underneath you, to be caught in a snare, to be taken and, and processed like some, some meat and discarded though you meant and intended to do well. Solomon is not, use, he's not mincing words here. He's telling us that when we work hard and do what is best, we need to be very careful of our expectations because very often, not always, but very often this world will swallow us and spit us back out after a good long chew. Because in man's wisdom, no matter how great, we are always at the mercy of time and chance. There's nothing we can do about it. Now, how many of you are familiar with Murphy's Law? 
Any Murphy's Law know knowables here? Okay, so there are two versions of Murphy's Law. There's the real version and there's the popular culture version, all right? The real version of Murphy's Law is uh, evolutionary nonsense. It basically states anything that can happen will happen. It's kind of this, this broad, overarching statement that evolution, evolution is right because there is enough time and there is enough chance, you see what we're talking about this morning, time and chance, there's enough time and enough chance that life will appear spontaneously somehow, somewhere. That's, that's the nonsense of Murphy's Law. That's the original Murphy's Law. Anything that can happen will happen. And that's nonsense. And that's one of the reasons why we spent so much time this morning looking at God as our creator, right? Because God spoke and it happened, all right? So anyways, that's the, that's the real version. The popular culture version is much more pessimistic, and I think it's the one that, that we're familiar with. And that is, if something bad can happen, it will happen, all right? That's probably what most of us think of when we think of Murphy's Law. Um, that's what Solomon is kind of getting at here. He's, he, seems to be, he seems to be pessimistic. If a bad thing can happen to you, just look out. Here it comes. It's going to happen. Murphy will strike. Man does not know his time. That's what he tells us here. For man also does not know his time. What does he mean by that? Well, I think we need to remember within the context of his book that he told us about time, right? There is a time to live and a time to die. There is a time to plant and a time to pluck up to plant what was planted. And as we looked at those eight or nine verses, the conclusion that we came to is that Solomon is telling us that God is sovereign over our times. Man doesn't know his time. We don't know if we're going to get plucked or planted. We don't know if we're going to live or we're going to die. God is sovereign over our times. And so man does not know his time. And sometimes, because of time and chance, which actually isn't real, because we acknowledge God's sovereignty, there comes into our lives things that we didn't know were coming. Things that feel like a hook, a cruel hook, that's going to take us into a different world, into a different mode of existence and destroy us, we feel. A cruel net. And we don't know how to respond. So whether in poverty or prosperity, victory or defeat, whether in wealth or in woe, we just don't know. But if we are living under the sun with wisdom, then that tips the scales in our favor. You remember that I just spent some time talking about how the race is not to the swift, the battle is not to the strong. Usually it is, but sometimes it isn't. Usually it is, and sometimes it isn't. Well, if we're living with wisdom, then we're going to have that usually. We can have a successful life if we live under the sun in this way. We can, most of the time. But time and chance catch up with us all. In the sovereignty of God, not in Solomon's pessimism, I think we need to understand that this time and chance is God allowing or causing circumstances in our lives to give us an opportunity to show that he is enough. And no, this is not Ecclesiastes. This is much more New Testament, and actually this is much more the book of Job, right? Because God, Job is the classic example of this. Job was minding his own business. No, he wasn't, was he? He was minding God's business. If you read the first chapter of Job, what was the guy doing? He was worshiping God. He was offering sacrifices just in case one of his kids sinned. And he was, he was loving God with all of his heart, with all of his might, with all of his strength, with all of his mind. He was living that out. And God says, Satan, you see my servant Job? And we all know what happens next. Time and chance happened to Job? No, God happened to Job. And Job, at the end of it all, says, God, you're sovereign. You're Lord. You have the right to do anything you want to do. The only right I'm going to claim is the right to ask why. And God says, no, you don't have that right either. Were you there when I started this all? Sometimes God 
allows what we perceive as time and chance to shatter our expectations, to make it so that when we thought that we were doing something good, that we were good at, that we were fulfilling his will, when God has got a different plan. Man does not know his time, but God does know. And as, if we as Christians wish to live in this world in a profitable and right way, then we need to acknowledge God is sovereign over my time. And since he has redeemed me in Jesus Christ, I am going to put my faith in him for every other detail. And if he includes Job's experience in my time, then I'm going to believe that God has a good plan and it is for my welfare, not evil, to bring about an expected end. And boy, sometimes that's hard work, isn't it? And yet God is sovereign over our times and God is good. And so we see there the trials of time. What about the weakness of wisdom in verses 13 through 18? There's nothing like a good story, right? 13 through 15 says, This wisdom I have seen also unto the sun, and it seemed great to me that there was a little city with a few men in it. And a great king came against it and besieged it and built great snares around it. Now there was found in it, that is that city, a poor wise man, and by his wisdom he delivered the city, yet no one remembered him. <clears throat> Small city, large army. We all have different categories of stories that we like, right? Some people, they like history. Some people like a good sports story. Others like romance, science fiction, fantasy, thriller, rags to riches. Well, this story here is another category of stories, and that's the underdog story, right? We got a little city, a big army, and one poor wise man. That sounds like the, bon the, the bones of, a, of an interesting story, doesn't it? Well, Solomon doesn't delve into it. We'll leave that to someone else. But the solution is that this man comes up with a wise, a wise solution to their problem. I don't know what it was. We aren't told what it was. There's a couple of stories in the Bible that look like this, but they actually happened after Solomon died, so he wasn't talking about those. I don't know. Solomon experienced something. He saw something, and when it happened, when Solomon saw this happen, he thought there would be a change in this wise man's life. After all, if he, through his wisdom and policy, saved the city, perhaps he should have a prominent position in it. But after he did his business... He was discarded. He was set aside. The people with power, in this city at least, and often in all places of power, were users and takers. Even the leaders of this little city did not care to reward this poor wise man. And if I know the way that leaders think, the fact that he is the one who offered the solution was rather an insult to them. And so no one remembered him. Under the sun, happy endings are limited. From this, Solomon learned something, and that's verses 16 through 18. Wisdom is better than strength. Nevertheless, the poor man's wisdom is despised. His words are not heard. Words of the wise spoken quietly should be heard rather than the shouts of a ruler of fools. Wisdom is better than weapons of war, but one sinner destroys much good. So in this story that we looked at briefly, the invading army, though stronger, was overcome by wisdom. Remember what Solomon said earlier? The fight doesn't always go to the strong, right? Here's your case in point. And we're glad for it. Wisdom is better. But wisdom without prestige, this is a poor man, he doesn't have prestige. Wisdom without prestige only gets heard as a last resort. Right? That's what happened in this city, I'm sure. And so Solomon's perspective here is that when a wise person speaks, listen up, hang around him. Don't look at his clothes. Don't look at his house. Instead, remember his wisdom. It is far better to be in his ramshackle house than it is in the great debates led by the leaders that are yelling at one another. Makes me think of English Parliament. They have a reputation for heckling. You guys know what heckling is? It's making fun of the person who's talking. You guys don't do that here. I'm very grateful. <laughs> Sometimes I know I deserve it. 
It makes me think of a particular presidential debate too. And so we need to approach with wisdom and not arrogance. We need to have the discernment to understand where wisdom is. And Solomon says here, wisdom is better than strength. Wisdom is better than weapons of war. The first half of verse 18. But whether you are wise and strong, it doesn't matter. Because back there in verse 12, man doesn't know his time. Man does not know his time. Therefore, one sinner can destroy much good. Wisdom is better than weapons of war. But even a strong city can fall because one man opened the gate. So what are we going to choose? How are we going to make the choice of God's will in our lives? We don't know what's going to happen to us around the corner. We don't know what's going to happen to our nation on Tuesday. When the vote goes through, we don't know right now who is going to be inaugurated next January 20th. We just don't know. And many of us, I know, are very anxious about that. But the battle doesn't always go to the strong. And the race doesn't always go to the swift. And the promotion doesn't always go to the most talented. Time and chance happen to them all. And from Solomon's under the sun perspective, that gives rise to much pessimism. But I will not admit time and chance in my Christian life. I will only admit the sovereignty of God. And so when we add the fear of the Lord to this equation, and I'm not saying Solomon was wrong, I'm saying he's presenting an argument that does not in this paragraph, comprehend the fear of the Lord. But if we take the fear of the Lord and overlay it, then time and chance turn to God's good plan. And no matter what the earthly outcomes may look like, no matter how it is that we may feel like we are a, a, a fish caught in a cruel net or a bird caught in a snare because we do not know our time, God is sovereign over our times and we must respond with faith because he has good plans, because he loves us. He loved us enough to send his son to die for us. Having given us his son, will he not freely also give us all good things? Therefore, who shall bring any charge to God's elect? If God is for us, who can be against us? And on with that passage that Randy read for us earlier. And so we should be a people of faith and hope, not fear. And so I pray that we will be. And that our image of Christ will include these components for God's glory and for our good. Let's pray. Thank you, Father, that you are sovereign and that we can trust you that we can look forward to your good plan for us in our lives now and all throughout eternity. And so I pray that we would be people of faith and hope and this, that this would be our testimony. In Jesus' name, amen. Please stand with me as we sing the last verse of God Makes No Mistakes. And when someday in heaven above I see his dear face May I then be counted faithful As a runner in this race But now I'm trusting in the Savior To show me 